As you know, last couple of weeks we've been going over 2012 World Championship Games, analyzing four of the 12 games of the match. As you know, match ended up with six score. So they played two, four more games, high break games at game 25 with 10 second increment. So I know happened to win that, to win that match, two and a half, one and a half. <coughs> so hopefully tonight we'll be going over games two and three. These two games could have been fate changing games. And in game two and number one, however, Gelfand had a drawing opportunity that they missed. In game three, end up in a draw and Gelfand could have won. So you see the game, the match was extremely close this year. So in game two, Anand was white, Gel, uh, Gelfand was black. He opened with e4. This is the third game that Anand opened with e4 in this match. And obviously, Gelfand, who is one of the best Najdok, Sicilian Najdok players in the world, he quickly responded with c5. Continued with knight f3, knight c6. Anand decided not to challenge Gelfand in his main repertoire, which is Sicilian Najdor. So three times in this match, he played bishop b5 variation, which is supposed to be one of the anti-Sicilian lines, Rosalimo variation, it's called. And <clears throat> as I covered in game seven, that uh, in game 11, I believe that they ended up in a draw. Black played e6 also in that game with the idea of knight g7 to safeguard the knight with possibility of e5, d5, or d6, and then finishing up his kingside development. So if white wants to give black double pawns, he must capture immediately, and then on did. Bishop takes c6, pawn takes c6. And for the second time in this match, Anand opened, he played b3 now. In one of the games of the match, he played b3, and Gelfand quickly played e5, and black had no problem equalizing. So in another game that, in the second Rosalimo game that white played, at this point, Anand played d3, which obviously e5 is not good, because knight just takes the pawn, wins the pawn. So the fact that Anand for the second time in this match played b3 means that he must have done some homework on how to play against black's e5 now. Well, apparently Gelfand had done his homework too because Gelfand played the move. So white played knight takes e5. The good thing about this line is that it guarantees pretty much white a draw. And the reason is it goes into a variation where queens come off the board, and Anand should not lose in a game where queens come off early. Plus, a lot of this is for his homework. So, black played queen e7, and in the last game they played in this line, white played knight c4, and after queen takes d4, queen e2, queens came off, and the game was uh, end up in a draw. However, in this game, white played d4. And as far as official records are concerned, this is the first time that somebody in this game played d4 at this point. So it's a novelty, this move. Black to play, d6. Driving the knight away from e5. And white embarked on an interesting experiment, which you can tell must have been part of his homework, but still. Knight takes c6. So black played queen takes e4, obviously queen e2, the only move, and queens came off, queen takes, king takes. So for the moment, as you can see, white is a pawn up. <coughs> so black played bishop e7, again white is forcing the issue. When you play a force variation, which I have no doubt, this must have been the position that Anand and his team were analyzing at some point during their preparations. They must have had this position. Because the nature of this position is pre-forced. So black gets his pawn back by playing bishop takes g2. And 
white played rook g1, and bishop came to h3. So how would you assess this position? Who is better? Well, black has the bishop pair. Bishops are not right now very active for the moment. And white has a slight lead in development. It's just a question of who is willing to get his pieces out quicker than the opponent. That's really what it boils down to. The question of this knight on the rim, which looks a little bit green for the moment, is that chances of black's best chance is going to be castle and queenside. And this knight is hoping to create some headache for the black king on the queen side of the board. So it's in the right place for now. So it's white to play d takes c5. Black has nothing better than to recapture. d takes c5. And knight c3. And at this point, computers favor white slightly better than black because of his better development. So black has for Blanc, and white played bishop f4. Black played bishop d6, trading bishops. Bishop takes, rook takes, and rook g5. All of a sudden, black c pawn is going to fall. Did anything wrong with rook takes g7? Rook takes g7 was an interesting choice too, but on that move, black probably would have played bishop f5, attacking the c2 pawn. And if white decides to defend the c2 pawn, say with rook c1, bishop g6 would have trapped the rook. Okay. And it's just a matter of one, two move to win the rook. So. What if you let the c2 pawn hang and play rook takes f7? Right, he could have done that too. Rook takes f7 was playable, and bishop takes c2 was also playable. And of course, rook takes a7 was also playable. But black will quickly, white king feels a little bit nervous sitting in the middle of the board. Black will play quick knight f6, and the king might be a little bit embarrassed with rook hg8 coming also. Black has a lot of counterplay, possibly to of rook d2. So oh, okay. It's, it'd be hard to predict at that point what would have happened. This is this rook takes g7 is a little bit greedy at this point when the opening moves are not complete yet. Black play knight f6. By the way, on rook takes g7, knight f6 was also playable with quick development and rook a8 check. So in the game continuation, white play rook takes c5, king b8, and black's rook hb8 can be very Powerful now. Also with bishop g4 check coming at the right time. So white needs that he needs to protect himself, and he decided to play knight c4 with the idea of check knight e3 next. And the commentator Swidler, who was annotating this game, he also mentioned this knight c4 knight e3 as one of the possible defenses for white. I was watching this game live. Sure enough, black played rook e8 and knight e3. Now black wants to weaken up e3 as much as possible. So knight g4 with the possibility of capture on the capture and maybe double a rooks. That's when you say rookie cookie, right? No, just kidding. So why to play? He needs to protect his square one more time, knight d5. And sure enough, black played knight takes c3, and white played knight takes c3, and black played bishop c4 check. Here, white has a dilemma. On one hand, he likes to keep the pawn on f2 to keep the knight guarded. So what should he do now? If he plays move like king e1, black could throw in f5 with f4 coming. If he plays king h1, then black may throw in bishop h3 check with possibility of rook d2 coming. So there are several variations he has to worry about. But it felt like e3 is defendable, so he played f3, the immediate check against uh, dealing with the check on, with bishop on g4. So on f3, this is a beautiful by 
Gelfand that probably I not underestimated Bishop back all the way back to C8 because from C A6 or B7 enjoys a beautiful diagonal against the white king side. Bishop C8. White to play rook e1. He knows that black is going to double up against this. From this point on, Anand is playing defensive. He's a pawn up and he's trying to hold on to that pawn and maybe try to win the game with that extra pawn. So rook e1. And black tried to harass him a little bit with rook h6. And if this pawn falls, pretty much everything falls along here. So white decided to hold on to it with rook h1. And now black played rook h e6. So the only move is rook c3, and black played f5, with a devastating move coming. So f4 probably would have fell to g5. That's one of the nice moves that black has. And bishop e7 at some point may be coming. So he played on a f5, played king d2. He's walking the king to ultimately save b2. Now square. put the pawn back on f3. Right. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, bad move by me. <laughs> so, f5, king d2, sure enough, f4. Okay, the good thing is this one is fixed in the light squares, which is the same color as black's bishop. So this might fall at some point in the future. White played knight d5, and black played g5. First things first, let's safeguard this pawn, and then go for attack. Moves like rook d8 or rook d6 simply brings rook d3, and black cannot attack this rook with bishop a6 because of c4, and on bishop a5, he probably plays rook d4, the only move. So he wouldn't have done anything. After g5, white played rook d3. <coughs> but now e2 is vulnerable to rook checks. Right, black played rook e2. G4 was a better, an improvement here. Some people recommend that G4 was the better move for black. No, sorry, not at this no. point. Rook E2 first, King C1, then Rook F2. The point of this is besides attacking the F3 pawn once, about to play Rook E, E2, and double up on this pawn. So some people got worried at this point for white how, and how white is going to handle this position. And now put up a beautiful defensive setup, so beautiful that even Swidler, one of the five-time Russian champions, overlooked white's defensive setup. So what he did was first h4, he wants to break this chain. And now naturally black played rook e e2. Right, kind of. Attacking the C pawn. And mm. knight b4 won't work because of a5, so rook c3 is pretty much the only move. Right. And this is where black played bishop e7. And when people were wondering, including Swidler, what should white do? Maybe rook b4, maybe knight c6 next, or knight f6 now. And now simply play rook d1. And the funny thing is, when he played this move, Swidler said, oh, I overlooked this natural and simple move. That's so move. this reminds me of that queen f2 move that an mm -hmm. played in game eight, that all these yeah. super GMs overlooked. Simple, obvious move in that position. And that's why it was overlooked, because it was simple and obvious. Too simple and obvious, <laughs> right. So rook d1. And the, the commentary here by Gilberto Milos is, suddenly white is better again because of black's game is in danger. Time, to, time travel is also an important factor here. So black played g takes h4, and white played knight takes f4, eliminating a very important pawn. And there are threats of rook d8 also, with the knight being removed from the default rook d8 check is coming. That would win the bishop. Right. So black played rook e8, the only move. <clears throat> and now it's time to deal with white's, uh, black's broken pawns. So rook h1, black, this 
Rook has a great defensive role as far as defending f3 and the fc2 pawn. So black played rook c8, offering to trade rooks. So white played rook takes c8, black to, with bishop, and rook takes h4, and black played bishop f5. Notice that black did not take the f3 pawn. That's an isolated loose pawn under attack. No reason to take it when there is something more important to go after, the c2 pawn. And, and, and protecting the pawn in h7. And protecting h7 pawn, very important. Yes, good point. So it's white to play now, and he played rook h5. That's a beautiful move that pretty much forces black to take with the bishop on c2. So he did, and I'm not throwing this check that forces black to go to the corner with the king, right? Because king on the c file, another check, and wins the bishop. Mm. Uh. So that's one of the subtleties of rook b, rook h5, x plan. King a8, and white is already thinking about checkmate. Mm. So knight d5, threatening mating one. Mm. Yeah, one of the points of creating mate threats against your opponent, even if they see it and they deal with it, is that it's emotionally devastating. I've been on both sides of this situation, so uh, I'm talking from experience. It's just when you create mate threats, it's really nerve-breaking against your, your opponents. So knight d5, and on knight d5, black obviously wants to defend the checkmate, so played a6. Now white is working out against the a6 pawn with rook a5. King b7, natural move. And white played knight b4. So it looks like the a pawn is going to fall. Black to play bishop g6, also under attack. And white won the pawn. Knight takes a6. So how do we assess this position now? On paper, white is better. He's got two connected pass pawns on this side. Black has one passer over here. And sooner or later, this is going to fall, so it's not really a factor. As far as minor pieces go, when there are pawns on both wings, obviously bishop is better than knight. So a little bit of advantage for black. But it may not be enough against two connected pass pawns. So theoretically, I would guess that computer favors white's position here. So after knight takes a6, black played rook takes f3. And white played knight c5, trying to activate his pieces quickly. King b6, and b4 the only move to safeguard both. And the commentary of Malcolm Payne here was that it's difficult to say if white is winning, but certainly white has some chances here. And Gelfand played very well in this part of the game and managed to hold. So black to play rook f4, going after the weakest link, naturally a3, and rook g4. The point of this move is that he wants to safeguard the bishop and at some point just roll the ace form while these two pieces are tied up over there. Rook g4, white to play king d2. King is going to have to play some role now. Either come over here and create some harassment against black pieces, or support his own connected pawns on that side. Sure enough, black played h5, and rook d4. As you know, the game is getting uh, black is in time pressure now. And when it comes to time pressure situation, knight is by far better than bishop. If you remember Maurice Ashley's lecture here on Saturday afternoon, he was talking about this point that knight is a much trickier piece to deal with in rapid and blitz games than bishop because of its unpredictability of, the, of its moves. So <coughs> after h5, White to play knight b7, trying to activate the knight. King b7, and knight e5. Now white's task is to somehow trade 
this bishop and knight, and this might be a, an end game. Because two connected pants, this rook should be able to defend this one. And of course, white is going to refuse trading knights and bishops. So black played rook g2, king c3, and bishop e8, refusing to trade. White to play knight d3. It's just a matter of driving the black king back and, and eventually getting the rook to harass the bishop and get behind the pass pawn. So black pushed upon h4 and rook e5, as expected. Bishop g6. Black has to be very careful not to, on the one hand, not to lose this pawn because this is really his only ace in this game, and also not to allow trading of the bishop and knight. So on white's knight of four now, <coughs> you throw in this check, rook g3, and after king d4, bishop c2, trying to stop white from advancing his pawns on the, on the queen's side. With the bishop here, now black is able to get his rook finally behind the pass pawn. Rook h5. So he gave a pawn, in effect traded pawns. The more pawns get traded, the better for black. Because he's hoping at the very end to give up the bishop for this pawn, and rook, rook and a knight against rook should be a draw. So sure enough, rook takes h4, and rook g3. He wants to harass the black king, the white king, from the longer side of the board. This position should be a draw, but it takes some technical maneuverings by, by black, correct maneuvering. And the trouble is that Gelfan is in serious time pressure, and this is one of the main factors that Anand was, was counting on in case the game goes into tie break. The fact that he was a better blitz player than Gelfand. So in this position, after rook g3, white played knight d5, and black played rook g5, and white played b5. OK. This is a decisive moment, the most decisive moment of this game. Black had a draw in this position, and he missed it. The move that Black played was bishop f5, trying to have an eye on bishop possibly going to that, that side of the board or this side, the flexibility. And if white is not careful, the game could easily end up in the draw. For example, king c5 falls to bishop e6, forced trade and everything, and it goes into a king and a pawn against king, which would be a draw. So, but this was the losing move of this match. Oops. C2. So it is white to play. What do you think white should have played in order to draw this game? Okay. Black. black. I mean black, black. right. Yeah, what about bishop d3, right? If king takes, rook takes knight. I gave it away, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> bishop d3. On the time pressure, I have to admit, this is a hard move to see. Yeah. You just don't naturally, as a human, think of putting a piece next to a king that can capture it. But this was one of the ways that black could have drawn. So bishop d3 was the move. Bishop f5 he played, and white beautifully took advantage of the mistake and gradually grind down and advance his king and rook to the six and seven and eight and drive the black king away, got a winning position. So starting here. Yeah, but would you explain why, no. why it's a draw? Good point, yes. <laughs> okay, let's look at White's option. What are White's options King here? takes bishop. Oh, well, King takes bishop. Then rook takes knight. Rook takes knight. That's the easiest draw. Then it's a draw. After sure. here, rook here. Sure. This is a draw. King in yeah. front of the pawn. Rook and a pawn against rook is a draw. Sure. With or without rooks on board, this is a draw. With the king in front of the pawn. So. Well, what if he doesn't take, right? 
what else can he do instead? Well, no matter what he does, Black's going to take the pawn for the fisher because that's going to go to Rook Knight against Rook. And well, it's wrong. Black's going to sack the Rook for the Knight and play Bishop takes B5 no. and Bishop against Rook. Bishop's going to take B5. See, if the King goes to C5, the Bishop's going to take the pawn. Right. 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 So what what should White do then? If he pushes the pawn. But what I'm saying is, even in draw, if black plays rook takes knight, and then when king takes back, if and then black bishop, plays, takes, bishop takes b5, and bishop against and rook, rook, rook is a draw. Yes, yeah. even in case of a pawn push, rook takes, king takes, king takes should be a draw. Right. So, this was one of those decisive moments of the match. So, I'm surprised Gelfin didn't see that. Well, because there's three different on, ways to On the time pawn. pressure, and he's uh, trying to, he's having an eye on win too. It's hard to say in this position, but now it's a case of one pawn on one side of the board and the battle of knight versus bishop, which favors knight. So, and now it has a, based on principle of two weaknesses, black has two, two weaknesses now. Now, one is a pass pawn by white and the better minor. The pawns on one wing, knight is better than bishop. So the game continuation followed, a, of course, announced your beautiful technique here in order to convert this into a winning position. After bishop f5, rook h6, bishop g4, rook f6, rook f5. Naturally, he's going for trading rooks, which would have been a drone also. White refused. Rook b6 check, king a7, rook g6 on the bishop, bishop f3, and knight has to move. He threw in this check in order to drive the black king to the back rank. Rook g7, king b8, and now it's just a matter of regrouping knight to get, and the king to both get close to this area, b6 area. Knight c3, and black played bishop e7, king c4, probably going through a5 square. Bishop back to f3, trying to harass the king and the pawn. King b4, and bd5. Obviously, white is going, not going to trade. So, king knight a4, and rook f7, offering to trade and control the second seventh rank. Rook f7, king g5, rook g5, bishop f3, knight c5. So, knight moved from c3 to c5, controlling more squares around the black king. Black to play king c7, and white to play rook g6, control the sixth row. King d8, and king a5. It is black to play now, and black played rook a5, and this it was another and the last decisive mistake by Black. Black's position is unpleasant and very difficult to defend in time trouble. The correct move was Bishop H1. I'm just waiting to see where the White King is going to go. With precise play, Black should draw. Of course, the second with seconds left, precise play is in it is a tall order. So instead of bishop f3, on rook f5, in the email that I'll be sending out this week, we have this position. That says white to play and win. So it's from a board championship match this time. Earlier, black did his best to trade rooks, and the game would have been a draw, and white refused. And 
White was trying to trade off Bishop and Knight, and Black refused. But now White can force it. Oh, because White can force a trade and get his king to b6. So what's the first move? Check. Knight check. Knight, knight b6 check. Right. And then? And then knight d4. Exactly. So that's a good thing about attending this class, because he already solved the puzzle for two. <laughs> 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 so, 96 check. All King. the other guys have to think hard to find out. Uh, King moves and then forky forky, huh? Right. King c8, knight mm -hmm. d4. Rook f4, knight takes, rook takes. And then King b6, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is a theoretical one game now. Of course, there's still some. For those of you who've heard of Lucina position, bridge building, and rook endings, you have to know that in order to convert this. So let's go through the moves. So this happened all the way to here. And white played king b6. Black's kings would be ex exposed from the b and c files and the pawn will queen. So the configuration of of the game was rook b3, rook g8, king d7, rook b8. It requires precise technique for white in order to, basically white's plan is to move the pawn all the way to b7 with the king on b8, then reroute the white rook to around here and check the king and build the Lucina bridge. So rook b8, and this is the moment that white resigned, I'm sorry, black resigned. But let's try this and see how the winning technique should be if you guys are white. So you're saying, you're saying play rook h8 is white? No. Is that what you're saying? Um, it's black to play, and let's say he plays okay. like rook b2. Then white goes king a6. And check. check king b7, rook back, on b6, and let's say rook b3, rook h8, rook b2. Black has nothing better than this, really. So king a7, and of course, if, as soon as this king gets close to the pawn, he gets a check, and then he pushes the pawn. So if he checks here, same routine on push, and let's say rook b3. Okay, this is where bridge building comes in. Let's say black goes here, it's white to play, say rook h2, rook b1, rook check, and king c6 fails to king c8, and white will point the pawn next, and it takes, it takes a check, another check, to win the rook. Up. Right. Sure. So king c6 is no good. So let's say in this position it goes to king e7. Then white plays rook e4. This is the process of Lucina bridge building. If you ever have a pawn on the, on the knight file, this, you must know this technique in order to convert it into a win. So let's say black makes, say, rook e2 and black play. white plays king c7 threatening to queen the pawn. So black has nothing better than to keep on checking with say rook c2, then the king goes to b6 threatening to queen the pawn now. So in case of a check, king goes to c6. And if black makes a king move, say king e8 or rook b1, now white plays rook b5 with the idea of rook b5. And once the rook is behind the pawn, white king can simply just come all, all the way this way and the pawn will eventually queen. And if white keeps on checking, it, black <coughs> keeps on checking again, and this, this time black, white king can go to b5, and that's the end of checks. With one more check, rook b4, and the pawn will definitely queen. This process is called the Lucino Bridge building in rook ending in situations where there are a rook and a pawn, often the knight pawn on the knight file. 
against stroke. A good technique to know, in case you want to master this technique, there are some clips that are posted on YouTube. Just type uh, brook ending Lucina position or bridge building brook endings. And there are some nice clips in there that you can master this. So you, as you saw in the game, black could have drawn this game uh, and on one. So I now white side against black Sicilian finally paid off. So he got two out of three, which is not bad against the best Sicilian player in the world, probably. 